joining me today is Conrad Snover, CEO of Procurability, the nation's leading procurement company offering advisory, managed services, digital staffing, and recruiting solutions. Conrad focuses on client success, employee engagement and culture, and product innovation. He has more than 25 years experience in strategic procurement and supply chain management and has deep experience in launching and managing programs focused on strategy design, procurement transformation, category management, strategic sourcing, supplier development, and organizational sustainability. He's consulted with numerous Fortune 1000 companies in a variety of industries, including oil and gas, utilities, technology, banking, and insurance, hospitality, and healthcare. That's a mouthful. Conrad, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thanks for having me. So... Tell me what the biggest problem is that procurability is solving for its clients. Yeah, you bet. The you know, I think the the way to bring this home for everybody on the out there in the in, in, in the world is to talk about some of the challenges that everybody experienced recently with the pandemic. Uh, so to kick it off, we're thanks for that intro. You really nailed it. We're a procurement services company. But we do more than procurement. We solve supply chain problems. And I would say about two years ago, most people had no idea what supply chain was even. Really? Yeah, I think so. I I think the average person, you know, if you're at a cocktail party and you're talking to your friends about supply chain, people would probably zone out and go to sleep. But now with the pandemic, supply chain is real. The, uh, you know, people went to the, went to the sporting goods store and tried to buy, tried to buy a bicycle three years ago. They were out of stock. They tried to buy a fishing pole during the pandemic. Out of stock. There was uh, global shortages of recreational equipment like that. And then all of a sudden, couldn't get a car, right? Couldn't buy a car. Price of used cars skyrocketed. We'd never seen this before. All of these things are supply chain problems. They're brought on to us by uh, weaknesses and problems in our global supply chain. You know, we truly live in a global economy now. And we rely on a supply chain that is intermixed between countries and regions. Different products are manufactured in different locations, brought together, manufactured in a second location, and then brought together, distributed, and sold to where you and I go into a store and buy it. That whole that whole supply chain, that whole system broke. So we help companies fix that problem. We help companies solve, uh, build a more resilient supply chain to prevent problems like that from coming from, from coming up in the future. Conrad, how much would you say this has to do with just-in-time manufacturing? You know, it's, it's, I love that question. And this is a great topic to talk about. Yeah. You know, in, in the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years or so, mm-hmm. just-in-time has be, be, be become a real uh, popular, did became, yeah. become a real popular well, thing, Let's right? define what that is in case there's anybody listening sure. who doesn't know what that is. So in... Just in time inventory or just in time manufacturing is basically a streamlined process where products are made just before the user buys it. Or, uh, so you can imagine, there's not a lot of stuff sitting on shelves, there's no warehousing, there's not a lot of materials, uh, you know, a supply, a big inventory that people pull from to manufacture the product, and the products aren't shipped to a warehouse where they sit in the warehouse for a long time. And then, you know, the shelves are stocked from there. Everything's just in time. So the raw materials arrive at the factory just before they're assembled. The product is assembled and completed and sent to the store just before you walk in the door and buy it. That just in time process works really well in a very well functioning global supply chain market. (laughs) That it totally broke <laughs> right. in the last three right. years. It completely failed. Yeah. And, and we had to rethink, rethink global strategy for, 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 for how we manage our supply chain, how we manage our materials. And some of this is esoteric, right? Everybody can understand what it's like to go into the store and not, there's no bicycle on the shelf and they want to buy their kid a bicycle during pandemic because soccer is canceled, football is canceled. So they want to go for a bike ride as a family. There's no bikes available. How is that possible? Never in my life right. have I had an experience like that. None of us have ever had an experience like that where things just aren't available. And it was a result of this, this global supply chain problem and exacerbated in the just-in-time world, which is why we saw problems in the automotive industry and why we saw prices of used cars 
spiking so high because nobody could get a new car. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, I, I mean, we're, <laughs> I want to stay on this for a minute. I mean, this is probably not the last time we're going to see this happen. <laughs> um, so I have to wonder what companies are doing to fix this. We're spending a lot of time these days talking about sustainable supply chain, uh, s- uh, sustainable sustainability of supply, uh, resiliency, and basically building a supply chain that is not overly reliant on anything. You know, Carol, what I love about business, I do something that's pretty specialized. We, we do contract negotiations. We create strategies for supply. You know, we're very, as a lot of what we do is very esoteric. But if you really boil it down to the fundamentals, it's the same thing that applies to so many different things in life. Diversification, uh, supply management. So in your portfolio, you probably have more than one investment. You have more than one stock yes, in your portfolio. <laughs> you have more than one mutual right. fund. You have more than one investment vehicle. You have mm-hmm. stocks and bonds, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have annuities, you have insurance, you have life insurance, you have yeah. many, many different things in yeah, your, right. you diversify yeah, your assets. Right. So what we do fundamentally, one element of it is what is the right way to diversify your supply chain to ensure sustainability? How do you diversify your supply base? Do you buy all of your things from one supplier who lives in one country, who has one plant that maybe is in a hurricane zone? Probably not a good strategy. So we help companies with global supply chain strategy first to ensure that they're not overly reliant on a situation like that, that they have diversification, that they have a variety of suppliers to to ensure that if one is disrupted, that their operation doesn't doesn't suffer. Mm -hmm. So uh, Procurability was founded in 1996 as the Denali Group by three individuals. Uh, they rebranded to Procurability in 2017. Uh, you joined the company in 2001, became president in 2017, and moved into the CEO role last year. Tell me a little bit about really your journey to joining the Denali Group as a as a uh, managing partner. Um, what had you join them, and you know, stay with them for so many years? So I started my career, you know, look, if I go all the way back, I have a background in finance and information systems. And I joined a management consulting firm right out of college and started my work, cut my teeth doing consulting. And in that consulting firm, I learned how to do strategic sourcing, procurement, category management, operations consulting. Yeah, you know, I've always been just very hands-on operational kind of mindset. That's what gets me excited. And right. that's what I just love to make things work. Mm-hmm. I love to implement and actually make them happen. Mm-hmm. I don't write fancy reports that sit on a shelf and never get used. I don't write, uh, uh, you know, we don't do assessments unless it's focused on implementing a real improvement to the operation. From there, I joined Denali a long time ago. So about five years after the company was founded. I joined the founders in 2001. I've been with the company for over 20, for three years now. Uh, what, what, it's, it's been a wonderful place to work. The founders are very dear friends of mine at this point. I mean, I, I'm almost in that founder group with, given my tenure. Um, what has really kept me here is the, the mindset of the company. This company is founded on a couple different principles. Autonomy trust. And by doing that, we really let people shine. And so way back when I was in, I became in charge of my own clients, my own scope of work, my own team at a very young age. And I basically demonstrated proficiency and I was given more and more responsibility very, very rapidly. And that's an operating principle of procurability today. That's great. So, you know, you're, you are personally really operationally focused um, and on getting things done, something that you had mentioned when we first spoke that was generated through your upbringing, your relationship builder, and you know, you, you have said you bring humanness to your relationships. Tell me a little bit more about that and how, and how that's helped you succeed 
as a CEO? So we, I, 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 when I became the, basically the co, you, you alluded to this a minute ago, Carol, when I became the co-leader of the firm in 2017, 18, uh, as president, I really was the co-leader. And then over the five years that led up until today, or when the transition was made for me to become CEO, I implemented two operating principles, two strategies in our vision as a firm, developed a new operating strategy. And it was focused on, number one, happy employees. Number two, satisfied clients. Full stop, period, end of story. That's it. That's all I care about. Those are the two fundamental priorities of the firm. And those live in our vision. They live in every single thing we do. Because all I care about is making our employees motivated to do the best job that they can. If they, if, if we do a good job of that and they're motivated, they will deliver terrific work for yeah, our clients. They'll they build will. relationships with our clients mm-hmm. that lead their, their business to the, the right point and build relationships that are long lasting. So we're advisors, right? We're consultants. We to provide a service for hire. Our contracts are only as long as our relationships are long. We'll have a piece of paper, right? The, with a contract actually, you know, written down on a piece, piece of paper that says, we will provide this service for this tenure. And when it's done, if the client says, thanks, appreciate the help, see you later. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes they, 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 they needed us for a very specific scope of work and, and, and we see that as a success. But really we see success is when the client says, well, we're going to keep going. Let's extend that. And that's, that's really, really based on that relationship focus. And so why, why let me answer your question. Why, where did that come from? What, 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 why is that? You know, I've had some mentors over the years. I've read good books over the years. And the thing that's resonated with me, especially with Procurability being a resources company, is the importance of in investing in people. We are a people company. We don't have a building. We don't have a manufacturing plant. We don't have a product. We don't have a software solution. We don't have a, a widget. We don't make anything. We have people. Our product is our team. And so it's critically important that we invest in that team. And so that's been our priority ever since from the very, very beginning. And I can go all the way back to you know, when I was 18 years old doing... Uh, it, it, trail work in the mountains, cutting trees that have fallen across hiking trails. And I was in charge when I was 18 years old of a very small crew of three people. And we had a, we had a mission to clear this trail and there was nobody who could come to help. The, the only person responsible for getting that work done was us. I was in charge of it. That's it. So at a very young age, I learned it's on me. I'm not going to, I don't just punch out and say, Hey, I'm out of office. Bye. Who's responsible? Who's accountable for getting this work done? And that started when I was a teenager and that's permeated all the way through our company. So we don't have people who show up and say, Oh yeah, I'm going on vacation and out of office. Bye. We, We do, but that, but it's like, who's backing me up? Who's covering these things that I was working on? So it's all very, very carefully orchestrated, but it's a focus on people first and accountability. And that's, of course, anybody who knows me is what I refer to as talent centricity, right? I wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> so, well, yeah. I was going to refer to that yeah. because that's why I think we're talking because yeah. your focus on that and our priority on that mm-hmm. is why I think we're here together because we have such alignment on that on that principle. Well, yeah, I would agree. And and although you know, not everyone I order I I uh, interview has that, right? I mean, people have a piece of that, right? Um, but you know, rarely does anyone have a full blown talent centric organization. And, you know, I have to wonder if, you know, that has something to do with consulting versus, you know, selling a widget, as you said, right? I mean, I'm a consultant as well. So, you know, why aren't more companies that are selling things more talent centric? I mean, are they just focused on making money and that's it? And I'm like, well, you know, good luck. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's going to cost you, it's going to cost you a lot more. Yeah. When you, you, when you look at, you know, a giant company, mm-hmm. 
you know, I, I'm sitting here on my talking to you on my Apple yeah. MacBook mm-hmm. computer. So I'll use that as yeah. an example. You know, does every single person in, that works for Apple have the same, you know, client focus? Do they, does Apple have that talent centric focus on every single employee? It's impossible at that size and scale. So when you're a startup with two or three people, or we were five or six people when I started with, with Denali in 19, excuse me, in 2001, we became procurability. We managed, we maintained that close knit family feeling. We had Christmas parties at our house. We had, we celebrate birthdays. We send everybody a birthday present. We have uh, meetings that are very, very different and that, that, that you just can't do with a large company because uh, given scale. So there are things that smaller companies can do to create and manage that kind of family feeling. And then everybody feels like they're part of the team. They're not just a cog in a wheel. So they're, you know, they know the people that they're dealing with. You know, everybody on the email chain, everybody on the other side of the team's message is somebody you've spent time with, you've done fun things with, and you feel like you don't want to let that person down. So you do what you can in a different way than if you were just a factory worker coming in and punching the clock and doing the work. So what we've done at Procurability is tried very, very hard. We focused a huge amount of work on maintaining that. We've grown, Mm -hmm. right? We're no longer five people having a holiday party at my, in my house. (laughs) Now we're almost 200 people and it just, it's cost prohibitive to have everybody together. So we've had to invest and get creative and and engaging people and on our team and making sure that we retain that talent centric um, approach. Yeah. It hasn't been easy. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, What's the competitive nature of your industry? Like who else is out there doing this? So, you know, there's the, there are, I would say maybe three different kinds of uh, uh, firms out there. There are the very, very large consulting firms that uh, 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 sort of do everything for everybody. There are procurement specific firms and each one has a different flavor, but nobody has this breadth and uh, of resources that we do and, and suite of services. And I'll come back to that in a second. And then the third is there are sort of one-stop shops or maybe two or three people that get together and are trying to, 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 to do this as a, as a company and trying to, to, to trying to get their way. Um, nobody though has this suite, this comprehensive suite of procurement services. We've built procurability to be a truly one-stop shop for procurement for all things procurement. Right. So we have resources, we have different models, we have consultants, we have managed services. We can give you a small team to do a small project. We can basically supplement your team, give you 20, 30, 40 people to be part of your procurement organization and run it just like you. We have digital solutions, we have um, spend analysis and some of these other things. We can we do recruiting and help our our clients find full-time resources because just like you were alluding to before our focus on talent centricity was seen as a secret success factor of procurability and our clients many years ago said how do you guys do this so well can you help me yeah can you find me some leaders in my or for my organization And so anyway, so, so, so I, I, I go on, we have mm-hmm. other, other services, but that's the, that's the, the real, the real, um, the real answer. Kind of nobody does all the sweet, all the spots that we do. Right, right. So, so, and that's, I, you know, I found that really interesting when I, you know, before we ever met that this led you to recruiting because of the fact that you were able to fill a need that apparently wasn't getting filled elsewhere or wasn't getting filled, uh, well, <laughs> Which is more likely what was happening, <laughs> right? Uh, n- knowing the recruiting industry like I do. Yeah. Exactly. You and I have talked about this yeah. before in the past. Yeah. People think, you know, HR and recruiting is a back office function. Uh, <laughs> HR well, might well be. <laughs> the, the, uh, it, it depends. You know, yeah. we, see, we see talent management and um, people management and culture management element of HR to be very core mm-hmm. and strategic to the mm-hmm. way we operate mm-hmm. because we are a people person, uh, people firm. But 
the um, recruiting function for us is very strategic and, and you're, you're spot on. You remember that conversation we had a month or so ago when we were talking about that. This goes into why we do what we do. We don't dream sit in a room and dream up cool things that we think people want mm-hmm. and then go try to sell them. Mm-hmm. In fact, I'm not interested in doing that kind of business. That sounds very tough. That sounds, that doesn't sound that fun. That sounds hard, right? Cause then right. I have to say, Hey Carol, I got this cool thing that I think you want. And you're like, no, I'm not really interested. Thanks. And, and, or, or maybe it resonates with you. If, you know, if I, if I do a good job, what we do instead is we do, a, we, we, you, I mean, we've been doing this so long, it's kind of harder for, to, hard to remember 25 years ago, but all along the way, we have built and developed new service lines directly in response to our customers' requests. That's how we've grown our company. So when we, when we go to a, an event, uh, maybe a conference, or when we talk to a new prospective client, and we talk about the services that we provide, their eyes light up. Because they probably are just like my other customers that say, oh, I, wanna, I need that too. That, I mean, that's how we've built the company. It's been in response to market demand. As a, a CEO, Conrad, if you can think back, I mean, you've only, like I said, you've only been in this role officially for a little over a year, but you were, for all intents and purposes, co-running the company for, mm-hmm. for more than that. What would you say are some of the mistakes that you made and, and why do you think you made them? Well, Carol, I, that's a tough question. I've never made a mistake. <laughs> okay, the interview's over. <laughs> <laughs> Funny guy. You know, the, um, uh, that's a, that, is, that is a tough question, but you know, in all candor, of course, I've made mistakes. You know, and my mistakes are typically mistakes of, you know, there's little mistakes that are trivial. Everybody makes, makes mistakes every day. Um, there are the, the, the bigger mistakes, the ones you're talking about, mm-hmm. are mistakes that limit growth and scale. Right. For us, you know, starting as a scrappy startup of, five people and growing into the leading procurement services company in the United States of over 200 people that required changing the way we think about the, the operation. We can't do it the way we used to. We can't have the same structure. We can't just have one person kind of know how it all works in their head. We need scale. We need infrastructure. We need process. You know, the cobbler's children have no shoes. You know, the procurability consulting firm, uh, procurement consulting firm, maybe has a, uh, a, a a less than optimal infrastructure, and then all of a sudden that bites us, and we have to fix it. Mm-hmm. So our scale over time was a little bit slow, and that right. that created some problems for us, most specifically in. Oh, growth rate and, uh, right. and, and training of new people. You know, when you bring everybody, when you bring a new person on, you want to train them in the way we do it, in the way, we, you know, the, the procurability way. And that becomes harder and harder and harder as you grow. And Very so good. our, mm-hmm. for example, our training program, we were, we were probably too slow to build that. Uh, 10 years ago or so, we were probably too slow to build some infrastructure and support um, over the last, say, I mean, we're in pretty good shape now, but say five years ago to 10 years ago, there was, there was that scale phase of our business that was extremely difficult. And part of this is related to the way that we've you know, operated the company. It's always been organic and owned by the owners. And so We've had to manage margins very carefully, invest very carefully, hire very carefully, so that we don't overextend ourselves and have something that's the, you know large cost basis that, that that we can't support if 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 uh, revenue were to turn. So I would say managing that scale. If I look back and if there's anything I could do different, I, you know, it's easy to have hindsight though because well, our revenue has been going up f- forever. And mm-hmm. if I knew that it was going to go up forever at the, at the um, gradient of the slope that that curve is gone, you know, we would have had a different attitude, but we didn't know. And so we were always you know, very careful and cautious and sensible about it. Mm-hmm. Listen, one of the biggest, you know, I have I, clients ask me this all the time, you know, when, when do you know when to make the next hire? 
Well, it depends <laughs> on a lot of things, right? It's it's a hard question. I, I don't have all the answers to that question, even though I've been doing this for over 30 years. Um, but all I can do is, you know, ask questions to determine, you know, is this next person or next, next set of people, is this the right time to bring them on? Right. And because everyone has to deal with, well, if we don't have the business, yes, why do we bring somebody on? And then, oh no, we have the business. Now we don't have anybody to do it. So let me share our framework and then we'll check in with you on that. Because what we have is a revenue growth projection, which is Mm -hmm. based on, you know, it's a quantifiable uh, uh, Mm -hmm. projection based on current business, based on likely growth, based on new business. And all of that's, you know, our team, the, uh, our team's best guess of, of what that future will be. And that could change. But in order, you know, if we're, when we hit this next piece for every, uh, let me just make something up. This is not exactly um, uh, uh, functionally accurate, but it'll illustrate the point. Say for another million dollars in sales, I need in revenue, I need one lead, one director, uh, two managers and five consultants. Okay. So mm-hmm. now I know that, Oh, if this year I'm going to grow by 10 million, I need that model. I just illustrated times 10 and then Eight divide people. that by 12 months and I can have a ramp cycle that works conceptually. But then what happens is a, a, a new deal is slowed down. You know, I think it's going to, I think it's going to hit in July and it hits in September. This happens every day. So it's the micro adjustments that are the real challenge for me. How have you seen people handle both those growth projections resulting in talent and then also the micro adjustments? Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's, that's why I say it's, it's a challenge. It's different for every company. And I've seen companies make those hires and then they're like, oh crap. <laughs> yeah. We don't, the business didn't come in when we thought it would be. And that's, you know, that's the, that is, I think the single hardest thing for any company is, is those projections because often you'll, you'll do it based on your past growth, right? So, well, this is the most predictable way to, you know, to, to see where we're going to grow here in the next year, five years, because we've done this over the past five years, right? And then a pandemic hits <laughs> and then, you know, the, the veritable shit hits the fan, right? So, so, and it changes everything. And, you know, you're dealing with companies, you're dealing with somebody who has to sign off on it. Maybe they're the decision maker, maybe the decision maker's above them. And then that person's out because they just had surgery or they're on vacation and, or whatever, any of the other multitude of things that they have to do that may be more important. <laughs> and that slows down your deal. Mm-hmm. So that's why I said, I, I mean, I am not omniscient. <laughs> I wish I was. Um, but, you know, all I can do is ask questions and do the best we can to predict, is this the right time to make this higher? Maybe we should make one instead of two. Um, and let's see how things go. And, and realize as we make that higher that to talk with that person in the, in the interview cycle, this is what could possibly happen. And right, That's the transparency that, that I also have companies do when we start to build a talent strategy. It's super important to just be open and honest with people in your recruiting cycle. And I will take it. I agree with you 100. I think that's spot on. Uh, it also other so some companies will use an adjustment as an opportunity to maybe right size their organization. Companies often grow very fast and sort of maybe just hire very quickly. And inevitably, you're going to make some hires that are that are that are excellent, and maybe some hires that are not so excellent. And so you can use that opportunity to maybe ad- make some adjustments. You know, fundamentally, I, I talked earlier about diversification, right? Such a basic, like, fundamental pr- principle that we should employ in our life in general, right? With with most things. Uh, another one is this brings up my second one, operating principle, which is create a plan, manage the plan, and then adjust the plan. So, what happens? You know, let me just bring that home. We'll have this revenue projection that says, I'm going to continue with my made up numbers from a minute ago, you know, a million dollars a month, five people a month to hire, to support that. That's going to be our plan. Everybody, we're going to, we're going to get our leadership team in a room 
We're going to have a growth plan. We're going to evaluate our numbers, our clients, everything else to validate or create that growth plan. Then we're going to discuss our team, our scale. Is it still the right structure? Do we need to change our our plan? We're going to come up with a staffing model. That's our staffing plan. Everybody's going to agree with that. Now, fast forward six months. I'm going to get an email from somebody that says, hey, this guy that I know is, you know, it would be a great fit for our company, this yeah. VP. Let's bring him in. Like, mm-hmm. wait, time out. Show me the plan. Show me where that meets on the plan. It, if it doesn't meet on the plan, let's have a discussion specifically about how it doesn't meet the plan. And maybe we make an exception. That's fine too. Right. But don't ignore the plan. Where you get in trouble is where you ignore the plan. And you start operating independently, or you know, let's say that uh, was, it, was a project ends unexpectedly, or some you know the, the revenue is slower than it was, or maybe faster than it was. But let's check in and change the plan. But I see so often in business, people don't do this. They don't create a strategic plan. They don't have operating principles, and they don't man use it as a roadmap and manage to it. That's where people get in trouble. That's where you hire way too many people. That's where you have a cost basis that you can't support. That's that's where the problems come from. It, it's the same. It's the same thing in 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 many people's personal lives when they're like, "Oh, I really want that. I'm just going to spend the money," <laughs> without realizing, well, probably I shouldn't be doing that because that's not in my financial budget. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. I mean, these are. I'm not. I'm not sharing anything super top secret and breakthrough, Correct. you know, guru on a mountain that nobody's ever, you yeah. know, enlightenment level stuff right. here, but you know, fundamental business practices as they apply to business, mm-hmm. as they apply to, you know, your personal life, it's just critical. Mm-hmm. So many of us, I mean, look, I'm guilty of this too. Show up at work. We react to an email. Boom, boom, boom. Here's what we need to do. Oh, wait a minute. How does that align with our plan? Does that, is that an early indicator that our plan is off mm-hmm. that we need mm-hmm. to change it? Mm-hmm. So getting out of the everyday tactical activity, backing up and taking a strategic view is tough. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's not something that everybody can do uh, easily. And it's something we have to remind ourselves to every day. I'm sure you deal with that with your clients all the time. I mean, how well, many times you know. do you say, hey, guys, <laughs> pause, look at the strategy for a minute. Right. Get right. out of the weeds and let's solve right. it together. Exactly. Well, and, and that's, you know, that's the whole point of, you know, ultimately doing discovery ahead of time. Let's see where we're, let's see where our gaps are in alignment <laughs> and get those gaps, start to close those gaps before we can do anything about, you know, your talent strategy or anything else. Uh, this is the number one product that we deliver to the market, Carol. We do an assessment and a strategy roadmap. We have clients all the time say, my procurement organization, my procurement function is suboptimized. I know here, here, and here. And then something else is broken, but I don't know what it is. That's just an example. Somebody else might say, uh, geez, you know, I, 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 we're, we're, our, our backlog is, is unmanageable. Our process is broken somewhere. Can you help us? Uh, mm-hmm. Others will say, you know, we're on the cusp. You know, we're, we're, we're antiquated technolo- technologically. We're on the cusp of, you know, needing significant technology investments, but we're not really sure where and how. How do we do this? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we have something that is exactly what you just described. Current state assessment, gap analysis, future state recommendation, strategy roadmap with mm-hmm. initiatives to achieve right. your corporate That's objectives. Right. And exactly we right. coach our procurement clients and our supply chain clients to make sure their roadmap supports the overall corporate roadmap. And then they can align with their leaders and demonstrate that their strategy will enable the overall business success. That's the number one thing we do is what you just said. I couldn't have, you couldn't have teed it up any better. <laughs> well, uh, that's great. So um, do you have an ideal client, Conrad? So it's interesting. You know, every single company in the world does procurement. Every yeah. single company in the world, whether it's your, the landscaper that cuts your grass, that landscaper mm-hmm. buys a lawnmower and a trailer and garbage cans and rakes and shovels. Sure. Apple, the company that I just mentioned before, they buy chips, transistors, motherboards, glass, titanium, steel, people. 
resources, real estate sources, janitorial sources. Every single company in the world does procurement. My ideal client is every single company in the world that, I mean, obviously not, don't have the scale to um, support the landscaper, but every single company in the world that has a procurement function that is trying to make their procurement organization better. Every, any company in the world that's trying to improve their, the operation of their supply chain. So it's great. We do focus in industries. And I think when you did my intro, you rattled off a few of our, the ones where we focus a lot of time on. And that's just because we build expertise and relationships and things like that. But the beautiful thing about procurement and supply chain is that it's literally every single company in the world. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if if you cast too wide a net, right, what happens? Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, there's size. You know, there's, you know, we, yeah. we, you know, of course. Yeah. Do you have a sweet spot? You know, we, we are in about the, the, the fortune 1000, yeah. uh, that, that, that's really where we do the best because, uh, companies that are, you know, we're not one of the biggest firms in the world. So we do have limits in our operational capability. Although the work we do, because it's advisory, those limits are often a perception, not a reality, but you know, things like global scale and operation might be a limiting factor. So the very, very largest, the Fortune 100, sometimes are probably not where we work. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. literally everybody from there to a thousand is is in our in our spot. Now we do a lot of work in the industries that you listed: utilities, healthcare, hospitality, uh, consumer products, etc. Because that just seems to be a good fit. Those companies have a have a real supply chain. They often need help. They have complex problems and systems, solutions, processes, material flows, warehouse design, network problems. Uh, so, so those industries that you rattled off of about that size are really where we see a lot of success. But if somebody calls me outside of that sweet spot and it's a good fit, away we go. You'll do it. Yeah, sure. No, I get that. Um, how, do your, how do you typically find your prospects? Are you doing inbound marketing, outbound marketing, a combination of both, referrals? Our company's growth has been mostly driven by relationships. So those relationships are developed, managed by our leadership team, across our leadership team. We have what we call is a, a distributed sales model. We don't have a sales team. And it's because the nature of the business is so relationship-based that it really requires people who know each other and trust each other uh, to, to, to start that relationship. So our leadership team is really critical to our success. We, we develop new relationships through conferences, events, the existing clients, past clients, past colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. And then we scale from there. We do have a marketing team though. I, I probably need to make sure that, you know, <laughs> you we can't just show up them. at a conference. <laughs> well, and I can't just show up at a conference and, and, and yeah. start to talk to people. I mean, people know who procurability is. And that the reason we, they know who procurability is, is because we have this amazing marketing team that builds brand recognition brand awareness with an amazing website and a web presence. Our internet activities are the, of the focus of that team. They okay, also you cannot, you cannot are, are an enabler. That. Yeah, exactly. They're also an enabler for the, for the leadership team for things like thought leadership and white papers. We That's do right. a lot of work uh, putting new papers out every month about that one topic or another, you know, supply chain sustainability and diversification, for example, is a recent paper, the future of procurement, the, uh, the, the you know, the, the five new trends that we see is becoming most pressing in the, in the next uh, five, 10 years, things like that. So that marketing team has a calendar, works with our team to create the content, publishes the content and gets a lot of awareness. And so that's really the foundation. Then when those like opportunities come in, it becomes, we convert it into that relationship focused model and, uh, and, and, and turn it into that very core aligned relationship that I talked about at the beginning of our conversation, which is how we become successful by enabling our clients success. Mm-hmm. 
So you have quadrupled the size of the company in what, about the last six years? Is that right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your talent strategy. Um, obviously, you've quadrupled the size of the company because you've, you know, as we talked about earlier, there's been enough enough business that you've needed to do so. Um, you also mentioned about, you know, we talked about the mammoth company that will never be talent centric because it's just really impossible when you get that big. And, you know, how do you, you know, for you, when do you get to the point where you say, okay, if we continue to grow, you're a privately held company, if we continue to grow, we're going to get to the point where we're going to have to start having a lot more turnover. (laughs) Have you thought about that even? A lot more turnover. I don't know if that, I, I suppose in numbers, but our, our turnover has been half of the industry average. Right. But as you, you know, I'm, I'm not saying up to now, I'm saying if you were to continue to, you know, to double or triple where you are right now, if you, if, that the main t- maintenance of that becomes really difficult, which is why I don't work with large companies. I know. <laughs> you're going to tell me that that, that that percentage is likely to change over time. And I think you're probably right. I think you're mm-hmm. probably right. Yeah. I mean, we, <laughs> look, it was many, many years ago when I stopped getting upset when somebody would decide to go somewhere else. Uh, yeah. You know, I, did, I realized that I shouldn't take it personally. There's, uh, there's a lot more going on. Uh, you know, people it's have some, different, yeah. <laughs> people have different reasons. And, more, and, and some turnover is positive. I mean, that exactly. does, you know, help diversity. And it, it's a balance of how much turnover do we want versus how much is really just damaging us financially. So I think we're very well positioned because we have, I talked a little bit about our recruiting function and just to double click on that for a second, it is something that we're very, very good at. And we're so good at it that, like I mentioned earlier, clients specifically request that we help them recruit mm-hmm. for their teams. Right. And so our recruiting team is, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a, a very large and very strong recruiting team. It's one of our core competencies and it's one of the secrets to our success. Mm-hmm. So on the surface, my first reaction is we do a really good job of recruiting. So if we need to do more recruiting, we can do more recruiting. I think we're well positioned for uh, that situation to occur, should it occur, like you're suggesting. And I also think that realistically, I mean, I was joking that I got over the fact 10 years ago when yeah. people would resign. Getting mad at people, right? Yeah, or just getting frustrated. Taking it personally, or taking it personally <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, because right. it's my company and like, why would you ever want to? But, um, you know, re- realizing the, uh, the, the the reality of life and a dynamic situation. And, you know, we, we factor it in. It's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's part of that growth strategy. And so when we have that revenue growth strategy and the talent hiring to support that, we also factor in turnover. And if we need to dial that turnover, if we see that turnover percentage too cre- high. creeping yeah. up, we'll adjust it. But, you know, so yeah. we've been very, very fortunate because we focus so much on culture and people and managing the team that we have here and really creating an exceptional place to work that that, that number has been very small. Carol, I would be remiss if I didn't just point out that we for, we just were um, we just received the Inc. 5000 uh, fastest growing uh, company award, and we, by Consulting Magazine, we were recognized Fantastic. as a great yeah. place to work. Very small yeah. group of firms were selected for this. It's based on employee uh, feedback and surveys, the number of employees who participate, the nature of their responses in this survey to on for Consulting Magazine. So to be named as a great place to work, a best place to work mm-hmm. was like a validation of everything I've been talking about yeah. so far this morning in terms of focusing on people and really focusing on the operational culture and internally. So hopefully we are going to keep that turnover percentage down to where it's been historically. Got it. So and there's a couple more things I want to talk about as we were starting to run low on time. How do you, how do you kind of define your talent strategy? Tell me a little bit about it. So the talent strategy is we look for that autonomy and, and, and leadership tendency, right? So we look for a diversity of backgrounds. We look for people who have shown that, that have an exceptional history 
you know, if, if we find, you know, two people and one person showed, um, you know, g- g- great resiliency through a time in their life and, 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 uh, built themselves up through challenge and hardship. That's the kind of person we look for. We look for scrappiness and, uh, creativity. And so all the way at the beginning, we really try to find the, you know, people who are differentiators, people who are truly exceptional. Then once they're in, we manage, we, we place our focus on managing their career through training, through mentorship, through uh, various work assignments, and this autonomous work environment with great amount of trust placed on their ability to grow only limited by their ability to uh, adopt new uh, tools, techniques, strategies, and skills. So we have a very heavy merit-based uh, promotion cycle and one focused on career development yeah. and one pulling from you know truly exceptional backgrounds. Yeah, I love it. So uh, finally, um, you are a retired sponsored athlete. Um, uh, in the cycling industry, I believe, and an aspiring ski mountaineer. Uh, so I know you spent a lot of time outdoors with your family. Tell me a little bit about, you know, being a sponsored athlete and how much, if at all, that's helped you in your career. As you can probably uh, assess, and you and I have talked about, I'm a little bit driven, a little bit type <laughs> and a little bit focused, and so very competitive. Historically, I, you know, I was sponsored triathlete, raced for Timex, started a cycling team, grew to be the, the number one ranked cycling team and uh, amateur cycling team in mm-hmm. Northern California. And, you know, it, it's really two things. Number one, it's an outlet. It's a way for me and others, obviously, to go burn, burn off energy and uh, release endorphins at a level that we can't do anywhere else by you know, <laughs> right. riding very, very fast, um, mm-hmm. racing, and uh, you know, sort of the exhilaration of going around a corner on a tiny little rubber tire six inches away from 100 other cyclists you know, going around a 90-degree corner at, at, at 40 miles an hour. It gets pretty exciting. So there's that, Phil. There's also the second piece, though, for me, it's meditative. And this is really where it's at. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion around meditation and how people meditate and Mm -hmm. are able to clear their mind and focus Mm -hmm. on the core. I'm a meditator. And Mm -hmm. for me to do an activity where I cannot think about that email that's in my inbox, Mm-hmm. That HR issue, that client escalation you have to issue, pay attention. it That's right. clears yep. my mind. And now yep. with climbing mountains, I have to think about where I place my hands and where I place my feet from a safety perspective. And I'm specifically focused on every single step of the way. And I get to the top of the, and I, and I have a clear mind. On the descent, on the ski descent, it's mostly skiing, same thing. So that's really what's so critical for me is mm-hmm. having that outlet to create a clear mind. Yeah, that's really fantastic. You know, and it's funny that, you know, you talk about that because I just just heard from one of my girlfriends today who she and her husband just climbed Devil's Tower. Oh, her wow. husband's almost 70. Incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's so, absolutely incredible. Good for her. And it was it was really challenging. She was like thrilled that at 62 years old she could still do this. Right. Absolutely. You know, so it and it does. And you have to have 100 percent focus on what you're doing. Um to your point, or else, you know, there could be a, you know, an accident, right? Something can happen. That's Same exactly thing with right. skiing. People don't pay attention. You've got to, you know, when you're doing a, you know, a mobile field, you have to look ahead and think, okay, what's my path down that? Mm-hmm. And pay attention to that and not other stuff. That's exactly right. And your phone rings uh, and all of a sudden you're... <laughs> distracted. That's right. All of a sudden you have a, have a yard sale, right? Um, so is there anything that I haven't covered that we haven't covered that you want to talk about before we sign off? Yeah, I think we've nailed it. I, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Um, you always ask the right questions and you always get in there and it's always, it's always fun to have a little back and forth in the middle here. So it's not just one way. So I enjoyed the opportunity to chat with you again. It's always wonderful to catch up to hear you know, your perspective that. on some of these topics as well. Uh, I look forward to more of it. Um, we could, I'm sure there's, 
I can think of two or three dozen more topics, but I think in the end of today. Yeah, I can, we, we could sit over martinis or a beer and, you know, just, you know, chat for quite a while. Let's get it on the books. Good. So uh, with that said, Conrad Snover, CEO of Procurability, thanks so much for being with me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Likewise. Thanks for having me, Carol. 